Hello, thank you for joining me at Kay Warner Studio. Today is the first in a series of watercolor for card makers. I just want to show you that um, it's something that everybody can do as long as you practice. I teach children, adults, early onset dementia patients, the elderly. I have all kinds of organized classes and I've worked for paint companies as well on teaching techniques and skill to many different levels of experience or non-experienced painters. If you leave a comment in any of the videos that I'm going to be putting on here in this series or you send your work to be critiqued to my website, the email for the website is kwarner at kwarnerstudio.com if you're not sure, just check out my website at kwarnerstudio.com and follow the comment section or I'll make sure that the email is listed on there as well as below the video here on YouTube so that you are able to send those to me. But your name, your contact information will be entered to win this wonderful watercolor palette. It comes empty because color choices are absolutely a personal decision. It has 18 wells, lots of space to mix. There's also a flare tray that comes out. You can mix on this and you can mix on the lid. So it's um, a good palette. It has this seal here so that it closes airtight. You would put your paint in here. You can use tube paint or the uh, pigment sticks and just break them off. And when you wet them, they would fill up the paint would fill up these wells and then once you let the moisture come out of this paint you'll be able to close this and take it anywhere you want to go without it leaking or um, combining mixing with one or the other okay so that's going to be it I'm not sure when the draw is going to be because it will depend on how long we do the videos now I want to talk about supplies you only need brush paper and paint I don't have all that much experience with the Asian paints. Now I know lots of people have them, you have them, I have them as well. But when I go to paint, paint, it's with the watercolors either Winsor & Newton or Daniel Smith. Now there are a lot of colors in either one, so I'll go through the colors here in a minute. I bought this economical paper because I'm sure that's what most people are going to use. This economical paper, this is a Canson watercolor. Uh, 140 pound, 300 gram. Now, if, if I could say one thing about the paper, cotton paper, cotton rag paper works better than a pulp paper. So if at any time you wish to splurge, and it's not that big of a splurge because you can get arches on say all reasonably different parts and different uh, suppliers, I would try to pick up a good quality paper you'll have better results and your learning curve will be a lot less of a curve with a better paper. I would also encourage you to get yourself, even if it's only one half decent brush, to do that. Now this is a Lowell Cornell, a Mystique. It has natural fibers and um, man-made fibers and it's a wonderful brush. It comes in round and flats and all of angles, but if you just get yourself a flat brush uh, to spread the water and a round brush and if you can't afford the two brushes get a round brush a size 4 or a size 6. The idea of painting is that you have a good tip and uh, you can use the largest brush you can get away with for the piece that you're going to paint. So that said you could certainly get an 8 if you wanted to. Now these are black uh, velvet by the Silver Brush Company and these are the same thing, a mixture of real and synthetic and they do a great job. They have a nice big well here. This is the ferrule and this is the well and this is the tip. Uh, they are wonderfully made and the idea of a good brush is that when it's wet and you go like this with it, it forms a tip, you know you've got a brush that somebody took the time to make sure the bristles were all laying correctly. So that's the brush you want to have. Also when you get a new brush they come with these 
uh, plastic caps. That's just for in shipping. They stay in the you know without getting bent because once a brush is bent, you really need to just discard it. So this is the brush. Once you remove this safety cap, you throw it away. You don't try to put it back on because you're not going to get it back on and those br bristles that bend back will have to be uh, trimmed off. You can get ivory soap, pan soap, just the, without any antibacterial or fragrance, or you can get this Murphy's brush soap and that's just for stubborn paint that may be caught up in the ferrule here. You don't want that, that ruins your brushes and to clean them it's always with cold water and if you have a brush basin that has the marks along the brush basin I'm gonna see if I have an old one around uh, I'll try that for the next one it'll have you know these pieces of plastic on the bottom that are it's stripes um, and it has a thing that's um, on an angle that's supposed to be for you to clean your brushes please do not scrape your brushes along the bottom of those uh, brush baths because uh, you will ruin the hairs of the brush and um, they're not it's not for brush longevity if you use one of those you'll go through the, your brushes so quickly and you don't have to this particular brush I've had for over 20 years. This is a Grombacher Control Plus and if you can find these grab them because they're a great brush. They come to a tip. They are just wonderful. The control you have off these and they're very comfortable in your hand. The other thing too is that you want to have control from your elbow so your arm is moved by your elbow and not your hand. Your hand restricts the motion, but if it's your arm is going by your elbow, you'll have great range. So that's about it. So we'll get into it. So the colors that we can use, if you want to um, just get into it and you not, don't really care if you spend $30 on paints, you would need um, a permanent alizarin crimson. This is going to be your red. Um, French ultramarine blue and don't get the I'm going to be a paint snob here don't get the hues you want the ones that are 100% paint you know pigment they have a pigment number if you have a dye that it just looks like it when we do our coloring mixing it's not going to work this is a limited palette I want to teach you the limited palette and how to mix so that you know and then if you want to introduce different colors as you go along well that's a personal decision and you can do that but if you know the basics you'll be able to paint anything with any kind of paint if it's a hue or if it's a dye it just looks like the color and it's not actually the color now these are um, Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith and I think this one here is a Jackson so I like to stay with the the artist quality but you don't have to get the artist quality if the paint is the actual pigment it's the actual paint you can go with that I know that some of the Van Gogh they have um, theirs aren't hues or dyes some of them are paint but if you'll just look on the side and see if it says it's a hue or there's no pigment number listed it means that it's not a pigment it's either a dye or um, it's a paint that when they mixed it up they say hey this looks like we could sell it for French Ultramarine and they stamp it French Ultramarine and they sell it whereas these are pigments and they have a pigment number this for example would be B, uh, PB29 that's what French Ultramarine is here we have a cad yellow pale and before we get into the well um, cadmium is poisonous cadmium is poisonous only if you eat it so if you're not going to eat your paint then we don't have to worry about it so those are the three colors you need now to be able to mix these darker we need a, a burnt sienna so if you could get that um, a burnt umber or a burnt sienna this is burnt umber sorry this one here is burnt sienna and then I have a raw sienna which will um, darken things so the four paints that would be ideal with are these first four permanent alizarin crimson French ultramarine blue cad yellow pale I think it is just let me see I've got it all done here mine I just uh, yeah cad yellow pale you can also get the Mayan yellow if you have an opportunity and um, there's two of them side by side 
get that one and then your burnt umber now I just wanted to go over some of the why we chose these colors so that you know so here we have a Windsor yellow this Windsor yellow you can just see that's a Windsor Newton it has a little bit of a green tinge to it now if you see that and the colors price is reasonable and you want to get that one then certainly go ahead so either one of these top threes the Mayan yellow which is a Daniel Smith the Cadge yellow pale or the Windsor yellow which are both Windsor Newton then we have a Hansa yellow light which was not good because I don't not sure if this camera will pick it up but it's really green it has a green cast so that's not going to mix colors properly and the lemon yellow has a green cast as well here is the permanent alizarin crimson and you can see that even though it looks a little pinky on this uh, camera it's really not and the Windsor red deep is really a dark color so this one will mix better and then here's a Windsor red and you can see uh, in real life it's actually on the orange side which would not mix good um, when you're trying to come up with a pink or a lighter color it would go more on the orange and that's not always optimal okay now we have the blues so this is our French ultramarine you can see this one also anything that this is in with the exception of a few colors that you mix will come up easily with a tissue or a kitchen towel then we have cerulean blue which will not make a good mixing color at all cobalt is not vibrant enough and it really loses its uh, color and vibrancy when it's mixed and then we these are the phalo colors okay this one here is a phalo blue on the red side and you can see that one and this is phalo blue on the green side if you want to buy one of these you can because that will be your booster color for some colors that require you know just need a little touch of it because once you put this in something it just overpowers everything so these here, either one of these on the red side, phalo on the red, or phalo on the green. If you could pick that up at a later, later date, that would be great. Now, having said all that, if you can only afford one paint, then just pick one. But I would go with the blue, because um, you can fade that out really nice. And if you fade this out, it will um, you'll lose the color, but the blue will always stay that you can tell that you've just used different uh, amounts of water in the pigment. So that's the paint. Now I just wanted to go in with this color wheel so we can so we have the yellow cover which is a primary color, we have the blue color which is a primary color, and we have the red. So we should be able to mix any color and any color within this spectrum with those uh, three colors. Now, usually people like to have the color wheel on red, so you have your cool colors on one side and your warm colors on the other side, evenly split. So we have the warm colors, so if you're trying to figure out if a color is warm, just think of fire, okay? So this is your warm colors and these are your cool, cool colors on that side. So when we're mixing and you're trying to figure out how to get different colors, we want the yellow at the top. So anything, if you want to darken the yellow, you go down towards the next uh, primary on here. So it's down with, and then yellow, if you want to brighten it, you'd use white or more, or, uh, you know, that's, that's about it, all you can use for that. If you want to darken it, you go on this side of the spectrum. Okay, and it's like that for everything. If it's red, then you go towards the blue. The blue will darken it. And if you have uh, the blue over here, your, your red will darken it. So, and one up, if you wanted to lighten it, you would go towards the yellow, but not much. So if you can just keep that, uh, if you have a color wheel, put the yellow and put it in front of you until you learn how to mix and just look at it. If I want to brighten it, I go one up. So your red, you come up towards the yellow. So you, you might want to try your oranges first. Mix some of the yellow with the red uh, to brighten that up. And if you want to uh, brighten up the blue, you would lean to a little bit to the yellow. If you want to darken it, you'd lean towards the red. So that's all that it is. So if you get stumped, just have a look at a color wheel. You can even bring them up on Google now. So that's that. And so 
all we're trying to do with this painting journey that we're on is we are trying to take a line drawing like this which is just something you drew with a pencil and turn it into something like this which has more dimension which is exactly the same thing I did it exactly the same way I just drew some lines across the center and thought well I'll make this look a little bit like a pineapple so that's all that we're trying to do the only way to do that is to have um, a shift in value. A fa uh, when people say that, they just mean how light and how dark something is. So um, the lighter it is, the higher number on the value scale, and the darker it is, the lower number. So if you just think that number zero, we're in the basement of some place, and as we come up those steps, we're getting towards the brightest and if you remember it that way you'll know that the numbers get greater and that means a higher value which means a it's brighter as you go the lower it is it's darker okay so the only way that you're going to give something dimension is by having a shift of how light and dark a color is so over here we have the burnt umber and we've moved our way towards the yellow which these parts which we want to look like they're raised higher than this one so we have those brighter or absence of color so that's all that really you do to do it so um, if you work on it and you pay attention to the shift in value you'll be successful and usually when you're critiquing something of your own work usually that's what it is there's not a value the value change is not significant or enough of it to the eye to register that there's a difference in uh, height or dimension and that's really what we want to do. Now this was drawn with a lead pencil so you don't have any lead bleed and I'll just show you what I use. I know we all have lead pencils but I, I just use one of these kinds of things so a mechanical pencil will work fine and just an ordinary eraser to remove it. Now this particular stuff here is graphite and I want to show you that graphite a graphite pencil will not um, be your friend in this instance it, it, it will move all around with the water and the paintbrush and when that happens if you have like yellow down there you're going to notice you can see that it's moved that all around and you don't want that you can see here it's moving the changing things gray so we don't want that so if you can use a lead pencil and then as you get going you can use um, the actual paint to make your lines with so I have something else here if I can find it so here's what we need to draw to do this pineapple all I did, just do freehand, it doesn't matter how great it is, just like a big A, a big oval, okay, big oval. And then just make some hash lines, so we'll just start here, and when you draw them, you want to take into consideration the shape of the item, so it would be rounded, so you make these lines a little rounded, okay and then ones on this side we're going to make these a little rounded as well okay that's all you have to do so when I say rounded these tips are pretty much if I have a ruler and I lay them there we can see that these tips are pretty much on the same angle with the ruler and the center dips down so that's really what I mean when I say follow the shape of the item and you can see it would be the same way here and the same thing here and the same thing here and then if we check on this side we'll see that it happens on these colors as well these this side of the pineapple as well we'll go to the next one and then we'll go to the next one
and that's just all you have to do. So stop the video, grab a piece of your watercolor paper, and draw yourself this image. I have it on the, I guess it's a smoother side because I have the blue swatches on that side. So when you're practicing, you want to use up every side of your paper. And like I say, once you get a chance to spring and get something that's a little better, you'll notice the difference right away. The first thing I want to do here before we get started on this is I want to show you how to mix black with these papers with these because you you don't want a true black but you want something that's dark enough so here is my paintbrush I'm going to take my French ultramarine I'm going to lay it on my mixing place so you can have a laminated piece of paper you can have a piece of plastic like this and I'm going to put something light underneath it so that you can see what I'm doing that's my swatch So I'm going to put that here so you can see just how much I have. Okay, so I need to get a little more paint here. So I'm just taking my pan. This was in a palette, but I removed it. So this is a half pan is what this is called. And I bought the pans, and then I filled them up with the paint out of the tubes. Okay, so here's my blue. And now I'm going to take some of my burnt umber. I'm going to mix that up and then we mix these together. Here's our dark color. Now the reason this does this is because my burnt umber, any brown, is treated like orange, a dark orange. The complementary color for blue directly across from the blue is the orange. So blue and orange will gray out. Yellow and purple gray out, or violet. Yellow and violet. Green and red. It's just how it works. Okay, so that's why that turns gray. So we're going to keep this on my work part here in case we need it for adding color to our pineapple. Now when you paint, all things are actually just four shapes. The four shapes are a sphere, a cone, a cylinder, and a rectangle, or a square. You know, something with four sides, and top and a bottom. So the reason why I want you to know that is because the shading for those things pretty much falls the same throughout. So every sphere will be shaded the same. Things can be a combination of two things, like a, a cone and a sphere together, um, or a cylinder and a cone together. And, uh, and on the side, they can be on the side, on the top, on the bottom, inserted, side by side. So if you just start to look at things as shapes instead of what they are, you'll find that it will be much easier to paint. So this is like uh, uh, an elongated circle. Okay, so we're going to take now the yellow and I have this on a moist brush and I'm just going to lay a little bit on here. Okay, and the whole idea is that you pick up some more water and we water this all down and now you want to fill this whole thing in and remember as watercolor dries it gets lighter and that's because the water dissipates and all that's left is the pigment so when paint is wet it looks darker than when it's dry All paint has a shift, whether it's uh, oil, acrylic, 
watercolor. The only thing that pretty much stays the same is gouache or gouache, depending on where you're from. Okay, so now I'm going to rinse that brush and I'm going to lay that down. Now you can come and get a piece of paper towel and lay that over the top. Kitchen towel, whatever you call it, shop towel, and you're just going to remove some of that. Now we're going to take our brush back and we're going to put in the center, not all the way around, so that the sides on this little box stay the same. Now I found where I'm not used to painting with this uh, cheaper paper that it actually pills up quite easily and um, I'm not really used to that so I'll just show you what I mean by that. This here, can you see the pills on this piece of paper? I'm not sure if you can get, get them. When I turn it sideways you can. I'm not used to that happening and that's why it's harder to paint when you have the cheaper paper. Uh, paper. Okay, so that's what we do, and you can see that I removed. And now we're going to go on this column and wet those centers. I just find that when you're learning this particular exercise, it's easier for you to remove it than to paint around it at the very beginning. Okay, so now we're going to lay our do the repeat the whole process and remove that paint. Even down in this teeny tiny one, you want to remove some of it. Okay, so I'm just going to remove the paint I have out of this brush, the pigment that uh, I picked up, so that we have the same kind of process happening to each one. And now we're going to come here okay we'll pick that up as well and finally the last row my last row you might have them closer together and have more rows so you just repeat that okay so we're going to take that up and then once you're done place that aside to let it dry. Now the next exercise we're going to do is shade a sphere. Because if we're going to use this as a sphere, a elongated sphere, we need to know how we need to shade that. Okay? So all I did was I took the center of my double-sided tape and I traced it with a pencil which is what you sh should do or if you have a compass or anything like that that will allow you to draw a circle or a lid but you just don't need a big one it's easier to move your paint uh, your brush around when you first learn how to paint in something that's a little larger than what's a little smaller so I'll let you do that and then you just pick whatever color you want to use to do this with. I pick the blue because the blue is a little easier to see on a camera. I'm just mixing up a little bit of it on my palette. Not a whole lot because I'm going to pick up from the half pan if I need it. Okay, so I'm just going to do it on this dry paper so that I can have control more control than if I had this wet down the water would move the pigment all around okay so we want to just bring that right around the circle on the outside of the circle the perimeter of the circle whoops And you can move your piece around. There's nothing wrong with that. 
and I'm standing to do this so if I was sitting I would certainly do a lot better okay and then we're going to get rid of this hard edge around here which is what that's called it's um, blue and then it's the color of the paper so we don't really want that to happen and we're loosening that up a bit right and then we're just going to take a little bit more of the blue and the and the um, water that we mixed earlier and we're just going to leave that like that okay now let's move this around a little more so we don't have such a stark difference and move that down into this wet spot and this will give you learn you some brush control here We're going to put more paint on here in a minute. So, okay, we'll just spread that down. Now I want to have my light on this side. So this particular color is a great one for being able to pick it up. So we're just going to keep that a little bit wider, and then. I'm going to put some water there and then I'm going to pick that up. So as you can see this color picks up wonderfully with a piece of paper towel or kitchen towel and the one that you use the kitchen or paper towel you don't want to that leaves lint or fuzzies anywhere. Okay so that's that and now we're going to I need to mix up a little more of my blue with my water so here it is not much just have a wet brush put my wet brush on my half pan I'll move that over so you can see so I have my half pan I'm just moving my brush into the half pan with the water and I'm putting it down here on a CD case nothing fancy you can spend a fortune on supplies, but you really don't need a fortune on supplies. You need a good paper, a good brush, and clean water. And you don't have to clean your water, change your water every couple of seconds, because you just don't have to. If you have a, a one where you can rinse it, and then one where you rinse it the second time, you should be able to do, okay, if you have a lot of pigment on your brush, wipe the brush on your kitchen towel or your cloth that you're using to paint with and go from there. Now you can see I use less water on this this time. There we go. Now rinse your brush, pick up some water, clean water, and then we're just going to move that along. Take away that hard line. So you can see this is where our white circle is in the center. This is where our other paint was, and we're just going to move that along. Okay, so we've got two layers here. And you can see how that water is, moves that pigment. See that? The paint lays on top, so that's what we want. And that is a sign of a artist paint. It just doesn't lay there and doesn't get moved around with the water. And you can see what I'm doing here. So I have a lighter blue here. I have a lighter then this is darker and this is the darkest on the outside that's what you want to do so you lay your first coat down just a little bit just redo what I did play that video back and forth if you need to and just practice this shape because this shape the sphere 
is in a lot of things around you that you're going to need to learn how to paint. It's amazing how many things are a sphere. And a cylinder is another one. You don't even want to talk about the square. So if we can just go like this. I mean all flowers are a sphere and we use a lot of flowers in card making. Okay. We need to take some of this pigment out. So we're going to move it down. We need to make this side. We need to move it down. I'm going to rinse my brush and now I'm going to go back to this so that I can move this a little better. There we go. Come over this side and move this down a bit. There we go. And then we're just going to do the same thing with this stuff. Just move it all around so we seem to have the same color here. We've got some granulation here with the pigment which looks good. Okay. Now we don't want to keep going and playing with it to death but we do want to make some changes. Rinse your brush again so you get whatever pigment you have on it out. And now we're just going to work on this line so that it's not so harsh. Just like that. All the way around. And if it looks like it's starting to deposit paint instead of moving around and get a little bit lighter, just rinse your brush, pat it on your paper towel or your kitchen towel or cloth, whatever you're using, and then move that around again, just like that. Okay, so we're going to be good with this one. that harsh line there and we're just going to leave that dry and we'll come back to it later. See how that looks? That's what you want to do with yours. Now this looks kind of like two different lines so I'm going to bring a little bit of that down. But not much because um, I don't seem to be helping any. I seem to be making it worse so I'm just going to leave it and come back to it later. And that really is the hardest part recognizing now we're going to bring this pineapple back because it's dry and I'm going to bring back my palette here and we have I'm going to bring out the raw sienna but if you have uh, burnt umber great if not then we'll just follow our mixing so there it is with the raw sienna If not, we're going to use our color wheel mixing and we have the yellow here. So we're going to put that down here on my makeshift palette. And now we're going to get just a touch of the uh, Lizard Crimson. And remember, less is more. So you start out with just a drop. Just a drop. Because we can mix the raw sienna with this red if we just go um, small little bits until we get it. And now we're going to use this again. And I'll put that over here so we have some extra. And if you don't go small, you end up with a big puddle like this. And then you're never going to get it the way you want it. So this is more orange. So now we're going to take our yellow again and I'm going to lay that down here by the blue. Okay and now I'm going to just take little bits of the orange because that'll be just like the red but we diluted it a little bit with this orange. You can see it's starting to shift the color. Okay, so now we're going to come in here. OK, 
okay now it's a little too orange for me so I'm going to pick up the blue and tone it down a little bit because the best way to tone down blue I mean orange is to add blue and you can see how that's done that so now we're going to take this color here and we're going to go around the perimeter and you can see how much more that looks like it's a raw sienna or a yellow ochre than it started out the yellow underneath it okay so we go right around here right around the perimeter and don't worry about those white spots we can go in and salvage those that we will remove the paint we can just do it again Okay, so that's the, uh, the outside, and we're going to rinse it off. Put it under. Take some of your water out. And we're going to do the same um, exercise on this one. Try to bring the paint out like we did with the blue. You can see that I'm um, not having the effect like I had down here. You can see how this looks differently than when I did up here. So you just rinse your brush again. Take some of the moisture out and start over again. So you want that pigment to move and I just want to show you that. I, up here nice and close. So when I put this water on, on here you can see that it's moving away. The pigment moves which is what we want. We want this to be able to move around we don't want to pick it up and just transport it we want it to stay where it is but um, move a bit more away from the edge and you might have to go back and fix a little bit more which you probably will have to do and I had a little bit too much water there so I'm just going to sop it up with my brush and then just move this around again I get rid of the hard line like we had before only we, we really aren't it's not the hard line we're worried about we're trying to spread this out so that we have a difference in value from that edge to this side As we want to darker on the side so that it gives it the illusion as in this piece of depth of depth okay so we need to rinse that brush off again because it's we're starting to pick the paint up rather than make it disperse If you have any questions at all, put it in the comment section or you can send it to my website, kwarnerstudio.com. There we go. So that's really what we want to do here. Just get rid of that. It's just like getting rid of the hard line except we're um, making sure that we have this coming out from the side so we have a change in value. Okay, so if you can practice that a little bit with a couple of circles that you've um, drawn and then come back to this and try to move your paint around. As I said, if you only have the one color, try it in the one color. So that will be all today and I don't want my video to cut out on me because I'm too long. So. These are this, this is the starting point for this pineapple. Just a line drawing. You don't need a special stamp or anything. We will move into doing stamps. On that note, anybody that has a suggestion on what stamp they would want to paint on or use as um, a learning tool on this video series, please enter it in the comments below or on my website, kwarnerstudio.com. So here's what the circle looks like that we were working on 
and if you can replicate this between now and the next video you will be that much farther ahead for when we move on to our shading complete shading and then we'll move on from this to the cylinder and we will have more paint mixing and a few other things so your recommendations on stamps would be appreciated and remember we have a giveaway at the end of this learning session so thank you so much for joining me and taking time out of your very busy day to spend it with me bye bye